Lubbock, Texas. Anybody here ever been to Lubbock, Texas? No? Nah? Well, testify. It's all right to talk while I preach tonight. You can talk back, okay? Lubbock, Texas. I was out in Lubbock, Texas. The Southern Baptist Convention, the Life Way, had taken me out there to do a, a faith conference, a faith institute. Uh, that, was, that was back when uh, Southern Baptists thought everybody could be saved. And so uh, I was out in Lubbock, Texas preaching that. I did my sermon. I was waiting on a guy to come over and get me. He had kind of parked me over to the side of the church. And uh, he was going to take me back to the hotel. And so I was standing there and I saw him coming. Saw him out of the corner of my eye. I knew. I knew who he was and I thought I knew what I, he was saying. I'd never met him in my life, but I had known him since the day my life had ended. Walked up to me and he said, hey preacher, how you doing? Now I'm in Texas. I'm in West Texas. How you doing? I said, pretty good, how are you? He said, good, he said, man, I liked your sermon. You're a good preacher. And then he said what I knew he was going to say. He said, you're a vet, ain't you? Now, I have to stop right here and say a vet in our vernacular is not a person that gives shots to dogs. <laughs> Meant that I was a veteran at that day and time of Vietnam. I said, yep. He said, never, never met a preacher that was a vet. I said, well, you have now. He said, I remember 1968. I was 19 years old. And I was a service station attendant. Full service, service station attendant. Now, I'm going to give you some details because this is this guy's life, just like your life. When you talk to somebody, you want them to know the details of your life because that's important, right? I was in a full service service station, 19 years old in 1968. He said, you remember how that was? He said, you'd pull in. Guy would uh, pump your gas, check your tires, check your oil, wash your windshield. He said, I'd have dropped out of high school in the 10th grade and I was just waiting on my papers to go in the army. He said, I saw her coming into my service station. He said, oh, preacher, I ain't never seen nothing that pretty in all my life. Said she is spending the summer with her grandma. She was going to the University of Texas the next year. And there she came into my service station. Had one of those little old green convertibles. You know, those triumphs. He didn't say triumph, he said triumph. He said she pulled in and I pumped her gas and he said, I, I, I hate to admit it to a preacher, but he said, I took a long time washing her windshield. <laughs> and he said, she made me out. She knew who I was. She knew what I was all about. And said, she looked up at me and she said, hey, Texas boy. No, she said, hey, Texas boy. What y'all doing around here for fun? He said, well, we go up Waco and we'll drink and we'll dance and we'll listen to country western music and that's what we do. She said, y'all want to go to Waco tonight? 
he said, yeah. She said, what time do you get off? He said, I get off at 5 o'clock. She said, I'll be here. You be ready. He said, I didn't know that if she could get into that bar up there, not because she was too young, but she knew how to get in. She knew how to do that. So she said, we went up to Waco that night, and we danced, and we drank. We had a good time. Yeah, you know how it was back in 68, don't you, preacher? I didn't say anything because I was not in Waco in 1968. He said, we got home about four o'clock in the morning. He said, I had to be work five. She went home and spent the day with her grandma and I guess she went to bed and went to sleep and I had to work and he said, about a quarter to five that afternoon. He said, I was about half dead. Here she came. And she pulled in and she said, hey, Texas boy, you want to go to Waco? And he said, at five o'clock, I checked out and got in that convertible and we went to Waco. Next night, we went to Waco. He said, on Thursday, she came down and she said, now, listen, what y'all do around here? He said, well, we go and get us some beer and we go down on the river. A bunch of us go down on the river and we'll listen to music and drink and have a good time. You know where this is going, don't you? You do know where this is going. Were you ever a teenager? Do you have teenagers? You know where this is going. She said, well, let's go down on the river tonight. He said, we went down on the river. We spent the night on the river. We spent the next night on the river. We spent the next night on the river. He said, we did that up in, into July. He said, it's July 4th, 1968. And she told me, she said, now my mama's coming to town tomorrow to see me. And I want you to meet my mama. He said, okay. So he said, that night, I went over to her grandma's house and he said, for the first time in her mother's life, she was introduced to the father of her first grandchild. You know what I just said? Now this guy's a vet. That's got about three million of you. You can understand his story. But we're going to expand it here in a minute. For those of you who've ever been pregnant and not married, that expands it into your world. He said, I didn't know what I was going to do. I was 19 years old and I knew that I was going to the army and she was going to the University of Texas and and then he said, I, I had to do something to take care of this problem. And he said, I couldn't support her. I couldn't take care of her. And she didn't, need, she didn't need all that. She was going to the University of Texas. And let me stop right now. With God, all things are possible. He did not turn to God. What happened was he turned to the medical community of Waco, Texas, where Baylor Medical School, a Southern Baptist school was, and he said the next day we went to Waco, Texas, and we ended our baby's life. And he said, you don't ever get over that, do you, preacher? And I said, no. No, you don't. He said, we promised that it wouldn't make any difference and we were going to get married and we were going to have children and we just couldn't do it right then. And, but he said, you know, that abortion cost me $160, but I paid for it every day of my life since then.
He said, you don't ever get over that, do you, preacher? I said, nope. You know. He said, summer ended. She went to the University of Texas. I went to Vietnam. He said, I was in a helicopter assault crew. I was supposed to write her every day, but he said, you know, I didn't have every day over there. 1968 in Vietnam, you didn't have every day. You, you, just, had, you just had now. And he said, and on top of that, what was I supposed to write her? She said, she wrote me every day, but what was I supposed to write her? What was I supposed to write her? Was I supposed to tell her, I can't stand this and I'm drunk all the time and my buddies are, are taking drugs all the time. What was I supposed to say? I killed a man today. What was I supposed to say? I am less than the human today. What was I supposed to say? My helicopter got shot out of the sky today and I lost my entire squad. What was I supposed to say? He said, you know, preacher, they ought to put every one of our names on that wall because we lost our lives over there. He said, when I got back, I said, I was, I was a mess. I didn't, I didn't know. They, they turned me loose and he said, I was, I was drunk all the time. I was an alcoholic. I couldn't, I couldn't live the present. I couldn't think about the past. I had no future. He said, uh, I met a girl and she loved me and we got married, but he said, you know, you know what I was like. And he said, it just didn't work out. He said, after two children, she, uh, she, she said, I've, I've had all I can take and she left me and I tried to go back to that girl that I knew in 1968, but I found out that she had got married and she was living up at Abilene, so I just decided I'd leave her alone. And, and uh, I messed around a while and said then she, I found out that she had gotten a divorce, but then I was married again. I was married to somebody else and I had a child with that person and so uh, she left me alone and, and then, and then <laughs> he said, you know, then my marriage, that marriage failed and, and I went back and tried to find her and I found out she was living in Austin, but she was married to somebody else and he said, he, he said it's just like that gone with the wind. He said, said we could never get together. He said when I, when I was single, she was married and when she was single, I was married. And so we just never got it together. He said, then I met my wife and she was a Christian and she prayed for me and she loved me and she got me in church and, and he said, I met Jesus. He said, you remember the day you met Jesus, preacher? I said, I sure do. He said, I ain't never gonna forget that. He said, I met Jesus and I got in a rehab facility and I got clean and I got me a job and I, <laughs> telling everybody I know about Jesus and I found out about this faith thing and I wanted to do it better and I'm trying to reconnect with my, my children and my previous marriages and I'm trying to make it up to my, my wife's kids and, and try, try to make it right with everybody. But he said, I just got one problem, preacher. I just got one problem and I believe you can help me with this. What do I do with 68? You got a 68, don't you? If you've ever had an abortion, you've got a 68. If you've ever had a failed marriage, you've got a 68. If you ever been in the military, you've got a 68. You know, I'm just about to get everybody, but everybody's got a 68. A time where, where you make some decisions and some things come into your life either, either on your own or from somebody else and it just, it just everything just seems to come apart and you think you can move on from that but it just wears on you and wears on you. It's those life-altering uh, death, life into life, death into death experiences. It may be good. It may be bad. It might be the time that you married your first spouse. How'd that work for you? 
That was your 68. Might have been the time that that child was born. Might have been the time you went into the military. Might have been the time that you went to school. What's your 68? I preached this sermon one time and a girl walked up to me and said, my 68 was the day that I went out on a date and he took advantage of me. Heard a lady tell me one time, she said, my 68 started when I was 11 years old and my father starting let, started letting my uncles molest me. What's your 68? Kid came up to me in Knoxville, Tennessee and he said, my 68 was the day I killed my daddy. Right now, right here. How do we set this thing right? How do we set it straight? Well, I want you to know something. Right now, Jesus is calling your name. Right now, he is calling your name and he says, there's, there's some things that I want to take, take, take care of right now. I want to touch your life and, and I want to, to heal you. But in the meantime, you live in a culture where there's so much noise, you can't hear my voice. I mean, any fool knows something's wrong in our whole world. It's not just your life. It's everywhere. Harvey, that's not your insurance agent. Harvey is a storm that even Jim Cantori on the Weather Channel said, God must really be mad at us. I've never seen anything like this. The Weather Channel is preaching judgment. Not to church, not to prophets, not that guy on television. The Weather Channel is saying, God is trying to get our attention. Irma, Las Vegas, do you think that can get anybody's attention? Opioids, the drug epidemic, the NFL for crying out loud. There's something wrong with the soul of America. And that's you and that's me. We can think anything we want to, but all the philosophers since Socrates say that your reality is your senses that are in you. In other words, if you live in this culture, that impacts you somehow or other. And so how do you escape that? How do you experience the healing of God for your own train wreck while everything else is coming off the tracks? That's what we're talking about. This is a sermon for desperate people who need, have a desperate situation. First thing I want you to see today is the intervention of Jesus. <clears throat> the intervention of Jesus. I, I want you to know that when God decides to intervene, he does it in the everyday rituals of life. If you don't believe that, you should have stood down here with me just a minute ago and person after person after person out of the last, last service say, this is where God touched me the first time. I wonder, are you listening? Are you going to come up and say the same thing? It's in the everyday rituals of life. The, the Bible says in Mark chapter one, after John had been taken into custody, that was his 68, that's John the Baptist, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of God. Uh, Mark is setting this thing up to tell you it was at the, at the right place. Uh, Peter is actually telling Mark what happened and this is Peter's call to Jesus. This is his salvation uh, experience and his call to the apostolic ministry of Jesus Christ. So this, this is Peter talking right now. He said, we were in the everyday ministry of our lives and the Romans were in control and everything was going, falling apart around us and Jesus came along in verse 15 and said, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. 
repent and believe in the gospel. He says, now is the time. It's in God's timing and it's time for you to repent. And and by the way, this is not a one-time experience because when this was being preached, there was a group of people down at what was called Qumran who were getting baptized every day as a sign of repentance. They understood that every day we have to come in and take a bath to get all that junk off of us that's been put in our lives by other people. You can't carry that. There, there's no, and there's no escaping it. It's all around you. Repent, turn away. Whatever it is that you've been doing, quit doing that, but you don't just quit doing something. You start doing the right thing. You start doing the righteous thing. So is it working for you? Getting rid of the junk is not enough. Turning away is what you do, but turning to is who you are. You've got to turn to Jesus. You see, you don't live life in a vacuum. But then verse 16, it says, as he was going... Along the way by the sea, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brothers of Simon, casting a net in the sea, for they were fishermen. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that. that, That's what they did for a living. What do you do? What are you doing? I I, I find out if you want to get real theological and philosophical with people, you you can't say, what are you doing? You've got to say, doing because they can't understand what are you doing. You gotta keep it simple. And Jesus is keeping it simple because he doesn't wanna cloud it with a bunch of junk. What are you doing? What are you doing? There's nothing wrong with getting up and going to work. That's how God is providing food for you and your family and the insurance for you and your family. There's nothing wrong with that at all. That's what we're supposed to do, but that's not our destiny. That's not our purpose in life. Your purpose is not to be a carpenter. Your purpose is not to be a plumber. Your purpose is not to be a banker. Your purpose is not to be a teacher. That might be your calling, but that's not your purpose. Your purpose, your purpose is to know God and to enjoy him forever. Now I just expanded our universe from the three million Vietnam veterans to the 50 million people that have had an abortion to the five million people who are Presbyterians who were discipled somewhere along the way and know the second Westminster Confession of Faith, which is part of your history. What is the purpose of man? To know God and to enjoy him forever. And we enjoy him by serving him, worshiping him, and loving him on a moment-by-moment daily basis. I'm setting you up. That's where we're going. That's what God is calling you to. That's what God wants you to do. And in verse 17, he says, and Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And they immediately left their nets and followed him. But watch this, verse 19, going on a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee and John, his brother, who were also mending into boats, mending their nets. Jesus is doing this again to show you that this is not something that just happened to a couple of guys back here. This is something that happened to other guys and it's something that is not not, uh, just unique to a certain time period, but it happened in the second century and it happened in the third century. That's why the the Holy Spirit has sent you. That's why the Holy Spirit has called men like uh, uh, Augustine and Aquinas and and, and, and those people, and, and now, now he's coming. This is your generation, and this is his world, and Jesus is walking through here, you through, you through here, and he, he's, Jesus is calling you. This is the voice of God calling you right now. Come and follow me. And the Bible says they did something totally radical. They turned and left everything they had. They left their business, they left everything, and they followed Jesus. General William Booth is the founder of the Salvation Army. 
King asked him to write in his autograph album and Booth noted, some men's ambition is art. Some men's ambition is fame. Some men's ambition is gold. My ambitions, the souls of men. What are you doing? What on earth are you doing for heaven's sake? The intervention of Jesus. Second of all, I want you to see the invitation of Jesus. The invitation of Jesus. By the way, denial is not a river in Egypt. Denial is a psychological defense mechanism where we refuse to take responsibility for our lives. You see, we want to blame somebody else. We want to blame our parents. And if you fall into that, I just want you to tell you right now that my daughter has her PhD in counseling. And she, she, she was do, trying to do a little bit of counseling with me not long ago. And she said, listen, Dad. She said, if, if, if you are 18 years old, if you're 18 years old, you can't blame it on your parents anymore. Now, I know you might have had a terrible daddy. You might have had a terrible mother. I know that but you can't blame them anymore. They, 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 that, that's what we're trying to do. We're try, that might have been your 68. Your mama might have been your 68. But we gotta get past that. We gotta get beyond that because if we don't, you will be a parent to your children just like your parents were to you. And they will be wrestling with the same thing that you're wrestling with. You see why it's so important? It's so important for us to get it right because if we don't get it right, then the people coming behind us won't get it right either. We've got to teach our children well. You can't blame your parents anymore. You can't blame your first husband anymore, or your second husband, or your third husband. You can't blame them anymore. You, you can't blame your wife. You can't blame your children. If you're in this situation right now and these things are going on in your life and you've got these emotions and these feelings, it's inside of you. It's not inside of somebody else. And they may have said something to put that in you, but you don't have to own it. Jesus says there is a different way of living. And I've come here not to make you feel worse, but I've made, brought you here to make you feel righteous. Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. That's the intervention of Jesus. That's the invitation of Jesus, but I want you to notice the inspiration of Jesus. What is it that motivates us to do that? What is it that inspires us to do that? Why is it that I want to follow God? Because he has invited me. Yes, he created me, but he has invited me and he places within me the inspiration and the motivation to follow him. The Bible says immediately they left their nets and followed him. Goes down two verses later and says immediately they left their father and their nets and they followed him. Now I, I am, I am a, a minister, I'm a pastor, I'm, I, I've been to seminary, I've taken the Hebrew, I've taken the Greek. I love the word of God. And I love to what we call exegete scripture. So when I, I, I looked at all of that, I said to myself, what does the word immediately mean in the uh, original Greek? Are you ready? You want to know what that word is in the original Greek? Yes or no? Immediately. We make this thing too hard. We, 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 we try to impress people with how smart we are. But could it be possible, listen to me, is it possible that God knows something that you don't know? He does. He knows your purpose. He knows your name. He knows how many hairs you have. You don't even know how many hairs you got on your head. Because if you counted them yesterday, there's less today. He knows everything about you. 
And he knows your destiny. He knows, your, he knows why you're here. He knows where you're going. He knows everything about you. And he has his hand on you right now. And he won't let you go. Immediately they were attracted to Jesus and they left everything and they followed him. He is calling them to a personal, dynamic, living experience with God Almighty. And that's what he's calling you to, to also. He's calling you to know him personally. And he's placed his Holy Spirit in you. And he's placed his word with you. And he's given you this church for you. And he's given you all these people around you so that they can encourage you and you can encourage them. And he's given you all that in order for you to be successful. He has set you up for happiness. He has set you up for contentment. He has set you up for that. So right now, I want to do something that may never have been done for you before. And this is just what God's leading me to do today. This is not my idea. I'm going to share God's blessing for you. We call that prophesying. But I'm not prophesying about all of this. I'm prophesying over you. It's encouragement. The Bible says, it's the word of God. It's not my idea. The Bible says in Isaiah 30 verse 18, the Lord, that's God Almighty. That's not just somebody that's got an opinion. It's not your mom, it's not your daddy. It's the Lord. It's God Almighty. The one that created you longs. Now, I set you up just a while ago. I'm going to reel you in now. That word long is an ancient Hebrew word. It's from a primitive root. Now, you have to understand something about Isaiah. Isaiah is smarter than all of us put together. And Isaiah, under the leadership and inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God, is more (laughs) eloquent and poetic than anybody that we know that has written anything about anything. I mean, it was Isaiah who predicted the virgin birth. It was Isaiah who predicted Calvary. So here Isaiah says the Lord longs, (coughs) and he went back and he got a word that has a primitive root that means it is more ancient than the Hebrew language. It goes beyond that. It goes way back there. It goes before Adam and Eve. It goes back to the heart of God. It is God himself. God longs. That means God waits for you. He sent all of this to you. He sent his word. He sent his son. He sent the Holy Spirit. He sent the church. He sent your sent people praying for you. He sent all of this to you to get you to understand that God is waiting for you to turn and follow him. The Lord longs, what? To be gracious, to share his life, to share himself with you. Therefore, since God longs, since God desires, since God obsesses over being gracious to you, he will rise up to show compassion. That is deep, deep, eternal, loyal love. You say, my kids don't love me. Well, what you're yearning for is a love that only God can love you with. Your kids can't love you like that. Your husband can't love you like that. Your wife can't love you like that. This is what I'm talking about right now. This kind of love that gives you identity and well-being and and safety and security and causes you to turn from all of this and and turn to God. It, 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 It is in the heart of and it belongs only to God and it can only be shared with you by the Holy Spirit of God himself. Amen? 
Boy, that makes me excited. That makes me just want to go on to heaven. Let's, 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 let's leave all this behind. Why? For the Lord is a God of justice. That means right actions and righteous thinking. The Lord longs to be gracious to you. Therefore, he will rise up to show you compassion. For the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed. This is a blanket thing. Now, this is everybody. That's not just you, but you know, you need to look over at the person next to you. It's for them also. You might want to wake them up so they get their blessing here. Blessed are all who wait for him. That word blessed is happy. Are you happy? Content, are you content? Fulfilled, are you fulfilled? At peace, are you at peace? Joyful, are you joyful? Faithful, are you faithful? Loyal love, do you have loyal love? Well, it's only for those who, it's very narrow, who wait, if you're waiting, you're following. If you're following, you're happy, content, you're fulfilled, you're at peace, you're joyful, you're faithful, you have loyal love because you are holy, 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 and you're one with God. He wants to exalt you. Now, I want you to listen. This is going to save you a lot of time and money. All right? You don't get out of a mess by doing something stupid. You can't fix drugs with more drugs. You, you can't make yourself happy with marijuana by taking cocaine. You can't get out of debt by borrowing more money. You can't fix a marriage by having an affair. You can't create security by ending your unbaby, unborn baby's life. But we all do that, don't we? Do something like that. Do what pleases God. You see, we're back there. Do what pleases God. You will never go wrong by doing what is righteous. Set your eyes on Jesus. Walk with Jesus. Talk to Jesus. Keep Jesus in the center of your life. Make him the subject of your conversation. Thomas made that discovery. Thomas was born in 1899 to a Baptist pastor and a church pianist. He was gifted and exposed to music at an early age. The things of God were familiar to, to Thomas. He, he knew them. He had been born with them. At age 21, he could imitate and perform the jazz of the African-American culture of the Deep South. In his late teens, he took a shortcut, though. He went to the speakeasies and the jazz clubs of Philadelphia and Chicago. He compromised his faith. He forgot about God. He turned from the truth. But God wouldn't give up on him. He was empty. He was forgotten. He was aimless in his wanderings. The nights would haunt him after work. So a relative urged him to return to God. and People prayed for him. And he did turn to God. And he wrote, when I did that, my inner being was thrilled. My soul was a deluge of divine rapture. My emotions were aroused. My heart was inspired to become a great singer and worker in the kingdom of the Lord. Young Thomas poured his energy into God-honoring music. And at that time, rhythm and blues met worship and praise. The result was a brand new genre of toe-tapping, soul-lifting music. He became a music director in a Chicago church. At age 26, he met the love of his life. They got married. He started a publishing company. He founded the National Convention of Gospel Choirs and Courses. 
He worked with some of the greatest singers in the history of gospel music. 1932, he was enjoying the blessings of God. He had a happy marriage, had a growing ministry. And oh, by the way, they were expecting their first child. Life was good. And then tragedy struck. He got a telegram. His wife had died in childbirth. Before he could get back to Chicago, the next day the baby died. He went into a deep, dark depression. He went into a bitterness toward God. He decided to return to his lifestyle. He resented God. He hated God. He went back to his jazz. He didn't want to serve God anymore. And then a friend came to him, took him down to a music school, and just let him listen. And that evening, God opened up his heart and spoke to him again. And he began, Thomas began to pour out his heart to God. And that night he sat down at a piano and he wrote, Precious Lord, take my hand, lead me on, let me stand. I am tired, I am weak, I am worn through the storm through the night, lead me on to the light. Take my hand, precious Lord, lead me on. By that prayer, God healed him. God touched him. And after that, he wrote over three thousand hymns of worship and praise. Life was good because God is good. Thomas Dorsey found out God is good. Joe Brown knows beyond a shadow of a doubt God is good. And by the way, you do too, don't you?